Not too long ago, this is how the pollsters put it, that this election campaign was a referendum on Mr. Trudeau's leadership and his character. The biggest changes were in the numbers surrounding that issue. Jagmeet Singh was seen as the man with sunny ways and Aaron O'Toole was scoring high on competence. Unintended consequences of ill-considered actions changes votes, or as British, the British uh, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan once said, in answer to the question, what is the most difficult thing about governing? And he said, events, dear boy, events. So here we are with Kirby Kaplan Siegel, the Honorable Michael Kirby, the Honorable Hugh Siegel, historian and NDP stalwart Jerry Kaplan. Well, gentlemen, what do you think's happened since we heard those wise words? Mike, we'll start with you. Well, I think the big thing that happened is that somehow the gun control issue emerged and there is no more hot button issue among people living in Quebec and Ontario uh, than gun control. Uh, hot button as in the sense they would do away with guns if they could, but at the very least, they certainly don't want any uh, military style weapons, which the government had banned by executive order, essentially. Yep. And the Tory platform said that they would do away with that executive order, i.e. allow um, military style weapons back uh, in circulation in Canada. And that was the beginning of the change in the numbers, because what happened was no matter how uh, the conservatives tried to straighten it out every time O'Toole commented on it, he said something different. And so yeah, finally, including I, like, he was, was going to leave the plan in place. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I can't think of any issue that the Liberals could have been handed uh, totally inadvertently, probably, but been handed, which moved more votes. And the numbers started to move immediately and they haven't stopped. Hugh, what's your assessment of that? Well, here's what I think happened. I think a hardworking volunteer in Liberal headquarters was going through an old drawer. And he found a copy of the campaign material from 1972 based on the slogan, the land is strong. And he realized, oh my God, we're doing the same thing now. Our ads for the first two weeks as liberals were the land is strong, work together for everyone. It was all that ooey gooey, self-reverential stuff. And it wasn't actually responding to how Canadians felt. Then as Michael says, the gun issue emerged and then bright people in the liberal campaign put together really what I would call effective graphic ads. A picture of all the semi-automatic weapons that Aaron would not, before he was confronted in the debate, have banned. Um, and that, of course, looked like the worst weapons in the history of the world. And that's when the Liberals got serious about the campaign and began to slow the, um, the, um, the momentum going to the other side. But that being said, I think this is an election where we're going to see more than one of those twists and turns. I think the first one has been adequately described by Michael. But I think there are now some other issues perking around on COVID and vaccines and the, and the um, People's Party of Canada and yeah. some chances they are taking, which is also beginning to affect the dynamic going forward, likely in a way that may be more helpful to the Liberals than they would have thought possible three weeks ago. We'll get into that vote splitting and all of those things in a moment. Jerry, what is your assessment? Well, there? I'm closer to Huey than to, uh, to Michael. Uh, uh, it's been a really interesting campaign, I think more interesting than people even understand, having watched it. The twists and turns have been even beyond things many of us uh, have run into in the, over the uh, centuries that we've been involved in all of this. Um, and it may well be that the ballot question on Monday for a great number of people, this is something we could never have said when we first uh, did this, is Jason Kenney. Uh, who would have thought that would emerge out of nowhere, literally out of nowhere in the last week of the campaign, that uh, Kenney's uh, messing about his terrible, terrible uh, uh, governmentalism on, uh, on COVID uh, would would have so many uh, so many ripples out there. But having said that, I want to go back to my first uh, first point. I think it's been, in many ways, a very high level campaign. I think four of the leaders have done enormously well, uh, and my exception would be, in fact, 
Mr. Trudeau, who I think has done the least to get himself out of his original bind, which is uh, why in the hell are we having this election? And unless he does very well, Michael, on Monday night, uh, I don't know how he how the party is going to react to having another minority government after going through all this tumult and all this lunacy of the last uh, of the last month. Uh, and Bear, I mean, that's and, the flip side, Jerry, of the of the Jason Kenney thing. Is it also allows people to say, why did we have this election again in the middle of right. the fourth wave? I agree with that, and I totally agree uh, that the Liberals have not answered that question. And so uh, if it is another minority with a reduced number of seats, which is the most likely outcome, uh, certainly there will be an awful lot of people within the party questioning whether or not the time hasn't come to change the leader. Uh, let me just make one other comment about the Jason Kenney thing, because I think that uh, Jerry was absolutely right. Because the other issue that came up almost at exactly the same time as the gun control one was the refusal of O'Toole to actually commit himself to to fixed mandates that to, uh, to with respect to masks, with respect to vaccinations. Um, he kept talking about how he would try to persuade everybody. Well, I think a lot of that's been going on for a long time, but we know from opinion polls taken now long before the election control, that Canadians are very con you know, happy to support mask mandates, uh, closures, shutting down if you have to, all of that. And it's very clear that the Conservatives were not going to do that. So that in Quebec and Ontario, which is where the bulk of the seats are, on both guns and uh, COVID, he has been on the wrong side of where most people are. And they're both very emotional issues. But, but Hugh, what we've also seen is, and, and you, we can debate whether uh, to make this move in the final days of a campaign is uh, very smart, but he's trying to pull himself in his whole positioning back to the center to become one of the old progressive conservatives. He brought out Brian Mulroney to speak rather than the Harper um, conservative, and that's been pretty uh, stark. So, you know, when he says something as he did the other night or the other day that this is not your father's conservative party, half the people thought he was talking about Mr. Harper and the other half thought he was talking about Mr. Mulroney. Like, it was confusing. Yeah, I, I think we sometimes read too much into who shows up at a meeting of 200 people in Orford, Quebec to lend their support, which yeah. Prime Minister Mulroney did to his credit. Um, I would say the, the more substantial question, though, is where would uh, Aaron O'Toole have been in this campaign if he had not tried to take the party back to the center? Right. If he had been happy with the constraints left by Mr. Scheer on the party's position on LCB, LGBTQ and a whole bunch of other issues, which are yeah. problematic. And I think he made the decision. And I think it was a good decision. You may as well fight for the kind of modern conservative party that is competitive, because however we do in this campaign, we'll do better doing that than if we just became a pri private right wing debating society. But it, it has created and fed and led to the growth of the People's Party of Canada, the PPC. Well, I think I think there are contributors. There's, there's, I think that's one of the contributing factors. Pam, you're right. But yeah. there's some other ones. Um, the anti-vaxxers the anti-maskers, the people who are resentful of doctors telling folks that, you know, these vaccines are actually clinically safe and proven, they're going to go somewhere. And they weren't going to end up with any mainstream party because no mainstream party is going to brook that kind of insanity. So the fact that Bernier is prepared to brook all that kind of insanity and invite those folks into his party, maybe his strategy for getting maybe a seat and maybe getting higher up in the polls, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the other parties could have embraced that same point of view. But he exactly. also he also got people on the carbon tax issue too, I think. Well, yeah. and, and, and look, there is a case to be made in a proportional representation system for a hard right conservative party, which then works with others to form mm -hmm. governments. In our first past the post system, where yeah. you get a plurality of votes and a seat to win there's no case at all not if you ever want to form a government and yeah. 
So Tool believes that he has a duty to democracy to give Canadians a choice, and that's what he's trying to do. Okay, but Jerry, jump let in. me uh, ignore Bernier for the moment uh, okay. and just exactly how dangerous he is. It's not yet quite clear, uh, although I think it's gotten worse in the last uh, uh, two weeks as uh, any number of nut bars have joined uh, his cause uh, for one reason or another. But let me say this, I think O'Toole has looked terrific in this campaign. He seemed far more prime ministerial to me than I had expected. Those uh, straight ons of him just talking away looked as if, if you put on a tie, he could well be in the PMO talking about that. I've, I've been surprised at, uh, at his effectiveness. On the other hand, uh, it depends on how much people know about him and what he said in the past. The credibility gap, Hugh, if you're a, if you're a maven about these things, is pretty great. Um, he, he has contradicted himself uh, almost every day in one way or another. Uh, and there's no way of getting around that. He's just got to hope that the new Peter O'Toole, is that his name? Uh, no, that, 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 oh, that's no, the actor. No, We're not oh, doing I, movie stars here. Yeah, I'm going to confuse with, <laughs> with Lawrence already. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so I want to tip my hat to him. That, uh, and he looked so much better than what was your guy before Shear? Who, who never for one moment looked serious as a potential prime minister. So I think O'Toole, from that point of view, has done as well as the party perhaps could have. Um, and I expect him to come a, uh, a very strong second, but who the hell knows? And what uh, about your own can guy? I make, what, okay, uh, go I ahead. One, yeah. one comment, since we were talking about uh, the People's Party. Um, where their votes are coming is not, I believe, will not hurt the Conservatives at all. It will lead to the Conservatives, instead of winning an Alberta seat with 60 or 70 percent of the vote, winning it instead with 50 percent of the vote, but they're still going to win the seat. I, I, I would be very surprised if there are re literally any seats in which the Conservative vote and the People's Party vote together exceed a winning vote of another party. In other words, I think that there's no way, it's not quite like liberal NDP fights where that's not true. I think they have simply ap appealed to a more extreme right-wing part of large parts of the rural parts of this country, particularly uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Interior, BC. And, um, you know, I so I, although he's getting a lot of votes, I don't think, I'm not worried about him the way Jerry's worried about him, but uh, I, I just think in the end he will not get any seats and he will not fundamentally alter the number of seats the Tories will get. But in closer seats in, in 905 or rural Ontario and even in some of the urban ridings in the West, when you're talking about splitting votes, it can be a factor. Of course, but I think that the areas you talked about, urban in, in the West, the 905 belt, there will be so few uh votes for the people's party that in the end as i say if you say let's suppose all those votes were conservative it won't change the outcome of the writing well yeah. but the irony, the, irony yeah. is, the irony is that while i think mike is right on how many seats the people's party do not get right there will be some seats where they'll get just enough for a liberal to slide over the line yeah and i think so too some bc writings just enough for a new democrat to slide over the line because they're dividing the vote one more way. Um, that may not be their intent, but that's how these kinds of uh, divisive propositions often manifest themselves on election night. But I worry about, um, about Bernier uh, way beyond Monday night. I worry about um, the home he is providing with some vague respectability uh, to, every, to any lunatic fringer in the country. It started maybe uh, with, uh, with free enterprise and then moved on to uh, wearing masks. And now it's everybody who's got a, a beef uh, wants, to, uh, wants to go with Bernier and some of them. It's I mean, a protest much, vote, yeah. It, it is very much the American model and it goes way beyond what most protest votes in Canada have looked like and what the protesters have looked like. I don't think we should minimize that. I want to, I want, I know, I don't think we should, but I think it's become, he's become the bigger tent because it, not everybody in that five, six, seven, eight percent that he's, the pollsters say he has is an anti vaxxer nut. I mean, there are people who 
are just fed up with all of the above. Right. Yeah. You asked about... Um, about I want to ask about Jagmeet Singh, yeah. About Jagmeet Singh. Um, uh, let, let me step back and say, I think uh, an election campaign in which the leaders debate features uh, two gigantic uh, people of color uh, is such a wonderful, refreshing thing for Canada that I embraced it for that reason alone. I think he and Anami uh, uh, are, are, are just wonderful characters, wonderful human beings. And they're both articulate, they're both smart. Uh, I loved it that she took off a whole day for, uh, for the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. I don't remember many of politicians doing that over the years. Um, Jagmeet has this natural kind of warmth. I say this objectively because I don't know him. I'd never seen him. We saw it first um, over the, uh, the blackface scandal in the last election when he came off the bus and instead of tearing uh, Trudeau to shreds, he just talked quietly about how, how important it was for us not to have that kind of quasi-racist, semi-racist uh, behavior from our politicians. And I thought if he had continued that through most of this campaign, talking really about himself, because he seems a quite decent guy, but instead of all these programs, all these policies, all the things he's gonna do to build housing. Well, I don't know that two people in the country are gonna remember what exactly he's gonna do to because build Because nobody housing. really thinks he's going to be prime minister. And, and I, I'm, I've been saying this for years and years, and you guys may or may not remember. I hate it when federal leaders talk about when I, my government will, and for years, I've advised them to say, I will fight for, I will push for, you can count on me. And nobody ever pays attention to me. They cannot resist saying when I am the prime minister. Yeah, yeah. Ma'am, I want to support Jerry on one thing. I think that Jagmeet has, has run by far the best campaign of any leader. Mm -hmm. I mean, for anybody who didn't know him, you cannot help but like him. You right. cannot help but think he's entertaining. You cannot help but think he's absolutely sincere when he's talking to just an ordinary person that he meets somewhere. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, if he were leading either of the other two parties, he, it would, the election would be a walk. Well, uh, you know, they've said that about NDP leaders and the Liberals for years, way back to David Lewis. And Ed right. Well, so, so Jerry, I guess the answer is that if the, lead, the Liberals do decide to change leaders, they, then, you know, maybe he should be a candidate. Uh, <laughs> Me, I'd like to be, but uh, I'm not sure about Jagmeet. No, no, not you, Jerry. I, oh, that not would be me. Oh. But, 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 but sing. I do want to ask you about that, Michael, because that I mean that's the theory. If if at the end of the day there is a liberal um, minority and maybe even a lesser one than he holds right. today, certainly that question of why the hell are we having this election will then have to be answered one and for all, once and for all. And the answer will be, we shouldn't have. Right. 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 So what's the process then? Then what will they do? Will they really say now it's time for a walk in the snow? Will they give him the option of hanging well, around a bit? What do you think is going to go the, on? The, the normal procedure under those circumstances is that, uh, you know, you go through the, the formalities of meeting the house and, getting your throne speech passed and stuff. And, you know, sometime next summer when you've gone through sort of 10 to 12 months, he, he says, uh, because he clearly would be unable to win another one, in my view, uh, if you go from a majority to a minority to a weakened minority, the trend yeah. line's hardly very good. Uh, uh, and so I think he would then call a leadership convention uh, or ask the party technically to call a leadership convention. Yeah. And, and then... You know, I think the two obvious uh, leading candidates would be Cynthia Freeland and um, help me here, guys, the former governor of the Bank of Canada. Well, Mark Carney. And Mark Carney. Yeah. And um, I think both of them would be very, you know, reputable leaders. They'd both be good. Uh, but I would guess that that's my guess is that's where we're headed sort of 12 months from now. So just on the Christian Friedland thing before we jump, uh, do you want to be the other candidate and be a middle-aged white guy and say, I'm going to challenge the woman who has been the finance minister? Well, it's possible that Mark Carney's uh, credits are so strong that he could transcend that. But Absolutely. 
But uh, but on the other hand, surely Pamela is right that uh, everybody's got to be on the lookout now for someone who doesn't look like the three of us, especially <laughs> Hugh. Hugh, you're being very quiet. Well, let me say this. I actually think that Mark Carney, who's now vice chair of Brookfield and has a series of corporate and international missions uh, related to um, a green investment and uh, all of that, I think those are multi-year commitments and my bet is he will see them through. So I'm not 100% sure that he'd be quick to step up in the event Mr. Trudeau said, I won't be leading the party in the next election. Mm -hmm. That being said, I would say that the Liberal Party today, because of how it's organized, structured, uh, is more focused on the leader's prerogatives and sustaining them than would have been the case in the past. I'm not passing judgment on whether it's good or bad, but I think it is different. So I'm not 100% convinced that if Mr. Trudeau comes back without a majority, uh, he will have to announce right away that he won't be leading the party in the next election. And... Um, and it may very well be that depending on what the mix in the House of Commons is and the issues, he may be seen as the only person who could actually manage a multi-party minority government for a period of time to get things done the company needs to get done. So I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be presumptuous about that. The other thing I would say is that if he does get a majority, then I think probably Aaron O'Toole's options become pretty limited because the right-wingers in the party yeah. are yeah. resentful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, but all of that is is uh, is based on results we can't possibly know now. No, exactly. Okay, I, I do want to have. Oh, sorry. I, I see Trudeau as the anti Mulroney in this respect, uh, Hugh. I, I see if you agree. Uh, I thought the most startling revelation of uh, Jody Rabel Wilson's book was that she had neither the cell number nor the email address for the prime minister. She could never contact him directly. I agree, Jerry. I agree. I was absolutely shaken when I saw that. Yeah. And yeah. Mulroney's reputation, Hugh, as I hardly have to tell you, is that nobody ever kept in closer touch and, and cosseted his uh, MPs more than he did and better than he did. Uh, so it would have been hard to overthrow Mulroney. But if, if the uh, Jody uh, thing is, a, is an example, uh, loyalty to the prime minister, might he might find is not as strong as he would have liked it to be. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I, I remember when I worked in Mr. Mulroney's office, the largest single operational unit in the PMO was caucus relations. Yeah. Uh, we had coverage, basically a senior staffer for every four or five members of parliament. Right. Uh, because Mr. Mulroney, in wanting to know how the caucus was doing and what they were thinking, was very exacting in that respect to his credit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to comment from all of you, and, and there's a couple of layers to it, but debates. So since, um, you know, Mr. Mulroney pointed the finger at John Turner and said, you had an option, sir, et cetera, et cetera, a great moment in Canadian debates, they haven't done much. And then this time round, we had another debate moment. It was not leader on leader. It was the moderator um, on the leader. So, and, and that has buoyed the, uh, the support for the bloc in Quebec. But we also had a debate where regardless, Jerry, and uh, of, of your real concern about uh, the PPC, they have support in the polls. Um, and Annemie Paul barely had her job by the time the election was called because of infighting in the Green Party. Like what needs to happen with these structures? And, and the debate format itself was just, I thought, terrible. But it, are they useful? Do we need them? How are we going to, um, how are we gonna fix this process? Mike, do you wanna start? Well, I, I, that was the worst debate I've ever seen by far. In fact, it was impossible really to watch, particularly when the tennis semifinal was going on at the same time. So you could <laughs> flip back and That's forth. That's a separate issue, Mike. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but 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 seriously, I mean, it was just such um, such a terribly produced thing, terribly structured. The moderator, which aside from her question, which was way out of line, uh, the way she cut everybody off uh, and and acted like you know an absolute sergeant major. Uh, made any meaningful exchange between uh, the candidates impossible. And personally, I would vote to not have another debate if it's going to be like that. I think it, that's how bad I think it was. 
Hugh, um, I, I mean, lots of people don't think the question was way out of line. They think it needed to be asked uh, of the bloc and their views on legislation, which uh, is certainly discriminatory, if, if not racist, right? You could have chosen a different word. What's your view? So I, um, I, um, I give Sachi Curl the benefit of the doubt. She's not, I mean, she's not a journalist. She should not have been in that role. Uh, someone said to me, you're going to be in charge of the national news tonight, but you'd better be at the CTV studio by 8.30. <laughs> I'd have no idea what to do. Yeah. And someone should have protected Sachi from that situation. She's a pollster and she's articulate and she's a very good guest on TV talking about the numbers. Yeah. But put her in an impossible situation, number one. Number two, I actually think that the way debates work is the network's and the parties sit down in anticipation of every election and they negotiate. When, how, how many, format, who's going to be the moderator. Whether their person will be, have the required amount of time. Exactly. Yes. Independent debate commission. You know, it's an agency of the crown deciding how this is going to happen beforehand and the parties don't have any direct involvement, I think is insane. Number one. And number two, um, uh, we should not be in a circumstance where an invisible commission, however well-intentioned, lays out the structure of how a debate is going to operate and all the leaders are victims of that process. So I don't agree that um, Sachi's question was a bigoted, racist question. I think the way she asked it was desperately unfortunate. There was a way to ask that question which would have given uh, the Bloc Québécois leader and all the others a way to engage without having to defend the integrity and decency of their own people in their own province. But she asked it in precisely the wrong way. It's because she's inexperienced. She's never done this before. And why would you have a moderator for a national debate yeah, who's yeah. never done it before? I mean, why, why, what am I missing about this? Where There are Steve Pakins and a whole bunch of other people who've done it well, and who are available, so that's very odd. Well, the, the, the simple fact that Huey's exactly right. I mean, look, the simple fact that I don't think I've ever even heard of her before in a debate. I, I've never heard of her. Where, where the hell she came from. Well, I, the well she works for a polling company, and she is on the air on, on networks talking but, about what numbers mean, which is yeah, what but, posters do. Yeah. Of course, that's fine. Yeah. So, I saw her as a victim of a flawed process, not as a perpetrator, yeah purposeful perpetrator of unfairness. I'm changing. And then every leader had to run out and say this was a crime against humanity. I took for granted, Pam, that somebody would have gone over her questions, at least her first ones, with her, and she would have practiced. And if so, and if she had said what uh, Michael and Hugh have pointed out, one of them, somebody out there uh, who were running the debate would have said, you better not do it that way, uh, lady. That's yeah, a, tone it down. Just, and I say that as somebody who uh, agrees completely what C tw Bill Twenty One does, but not her right to have uh, to have said it. Look, ever since debates were uh, were started, and I guess that was with Nixon and uh, Kennedy, and then here with uh, Tommy and uh, and who uh, Trudeau, Tommy Douglas and Trudeau, and must have been uh, uh, Bob Stanfield. Bob Stanfield. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, people have said we can't, they've got to be better. There has probably yeah. never been one in which we haven't said that. And I'm I just, think they can be better. Uh, I'm thinking in the days of so like now that we have all this technology and everybody's being covered 24 seven. I mean, unless you're putting three or four people on the state on the stage and letting them actually talk to one another, then it's just never going to work. Right. Said that, right. Let me say again that I thought, it was a pretty distinguished group of leaders, one-on-one uh, -on -one, by themselves. Yeah. I think Blanchette is a very bright, smart, articulate guy. Uh, I was surprised and disappointed how good he was. <laughs> and he's probably doing a terrific job in uh, in Quebec. And as I said, uh, getting the vote uh, out. Uh, the other, uh, all the other three, and even Trudeau sometimes uh, acquitted themselves as well as they could. So from that point of view, it was impressive for Canada to have this this kind of political leadership, but not impressive if what you wanted to watch was the tennis finals. 
<laughs> shot, shot, Michael. No, okay, no, I want to ask around with Michael. I agree. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I don't. If you ask Jerry, you'll find he switched over occasionally too. I'm sure. Yeah, I bet. I want to ask a little bit about was what wasn't on the agenda, and then maybe what you think it should have been. I read the numbers this week on inflation, which has hit its highest rate since 2003. Not a surprise. We have been spending madly through COVID for mostly good reasons and then as cover for other spending that people just wanted to get done. These are real prices. Um, gasoline's up 32%, you know, home, pur home purchases up 15%. Like this is real. And, and the inflation target is at 4% plus, and this is twice what the Bank of Canada says is acceptable. And as far as I can tell, nobody's mentioned this anywhere in the campaign trail. So either comment on that or what you think should have been front and center that wasn't. My other issue, of course, was Afghanistan and foreign policy. It was there for 48 hours and then fell off the map. So, Michael, what are your thoughts? Well, on, on the inflation one, it came up sufficiently late in the campaign that it's been, yeah. you know, no one was going to get into it uh, in the last week or so. The last numbers only came out a few days ago. Yeah. Will it be a major issue coming coming forward? Absolutely. Ab yeah. you know, absolutely. On the Afghanistan one, uh, two things. I was very surprised that the Conservatives and the NDP didn't go after the government on the way they started uh, their Afghanistan, uh, you know, the process of getting people out of Afghanistan, when they sent that very long email to uh, all the people who they wanted to get out and then told them they had 72 hours or whatever yeah. it was to reply. Fill out 12 forms and- Yeah, uh, you know, and they never had, the, of course, most of them didn't have, might well not have had email to begin with. So I was surprised they didn't make uh, a big deal out of that. But the reality is that unless it's a Canada-U.S. issue, foreign policy issues don't move the dial among Canadian voters. Never have, probably never will. Not true if it's Canada-U.S. Most people don't think of Canada-U.S. as a foreign issue. That's an issue with the United right. States, right? That's a separate yeah. category. It is, absolutely. Uh, and they don't. Uh, they So uh, not the least bit surprised. I was, as I say, I was only surprised at how awful uh the whole process began that they didn't go after them on after the government right. on that side right. it. i mean jerry this is your thing you're a you're a foreign policy wonk uh, are you surprised that nothing the relationship it was pretty clear that uh there are major concerns in the canada u.s relationship right now even if we're going to focus on that but, but these other issues as well Pamela, like you, as when you began just now, I could probably immediately write down 20 important issues that Canadians face, none of them uh, of the rank of uh, COVID and climate change. Uh, and so far as the campaign was given over to that, uh, it seemed to me sensible and important. Uh, getting into uh, questions of inflation, when we still have the foggiest idea how much money further games by the, the COVID uh, variant. Much further uh, debt we're going to get into. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, you reread in today's paper of across the country of doctors not operating on people who need immediate surgery. I mean, it's th unthinkable. It could be any one of us. Uh, so uh, money has to be, and that's why I also think the question of where you're going to get the money from is not worth the time of day these days. We'll get whatever money we need to fight this uh, this bug, or it's going to beat us uh, every day. You. So I would argue that the one thing that really hasn't come up, and it certainly wasn't really discussed in any of the debates, French or English, was the uh, ongoing issue of poverty. We still have 10% uh, of the population who live beneath the poverty line right across Canada. That's three and a half million Canadians. The programs that were brought in, CERB and the Child Benefit, were all helpful for middle-income people who were in difficulty because of the public health ordered closings. But for the um, permanent, if you wish, soft underbelly of the country, people who are living in, in poverty, both working poor and others, no party really made any serious recommendation 
I give the Greens credit. They stuck with their position on a basic income, which they've been at for about 10 years. But none of the other parties engaged at all. And some parties, frankly, uh, my fellow um, former fellow uh, partisans of the Conservative Party, said nothing about poverty at all, which I find deeply offensive. And um, I think we're going to find when we get through the next stage of analytics around the, about the pandemic, that the heat map of the country where the disease was the worst, where people suffered the most, where the fatality levels were the highest, were not in Point Grey, and it wasn't in Westmount, and it wasn't in Rosedale. It was actually in the low-income parts of the cities, right. and where they paid the highest price. And the fact that no one's talking about it in a serious way is, in my view, offensive. Okay, so this raises the issue for me, and 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 I I know it's kind of a big picture, but I read an article recently by David Brooks, one of my favorite writers. Um, he had written a book about uh, the bobos, as he called them, uh, you know, bourgeois bohemians, the creative class. This is that. He basically argues that the creative class or or that group in which you would find journalists and university professors and thinkers and all these things, that while they were, are supposed to be fostering progressive values and economic growth, instead what we see, and, and we can talk about Trump or the People's Party or whatever, but instead what we see is a lot more resentment, a lot more alienation, a lot more political dysfunction, and people just uh, pushing away some of the institutional stuff that we have always um, embraced more willingly in this country than in, in other places. Uh, I don't know, Mike, do you want to respond? Well, I, first of all, I, I think you're right, because I think that, that concern about those has been replaced by a lot of the concern about the extreme right, a lot of concern about, uh, for instance, the way Jason Kenney as a conservative behaved in Alberta, uh, there are a lot more targets of the income gap. So, so it's not that I think if, if they were pressed, people wouldn't concede that we've got to do something uh, about poverty. But there are so many other bigger targets and targets that really, really get people upset. I mean, I'm surprised how, uh, how much what I would call the ordinary peoples of, that I run into everywhere mm -hmm. Uh, are upset about the growing income back, uh, uh, gap between the rich and even the middle class. Uh, and I think that really does affect people. And that's, of course, you saw people talking about. I mean, by all the parties talking about I mean, about Trudeau that. was asked at a press conference the other day why hate had intensified on his watch. But I think we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing yeah, it in the US exactly. on the left and right. There are militant protests, um, you know, BLM, lots of other things going on, and it's all intensified. Well, and that, I'll tell you what really scares me is that I think that hate, as you put it, which is intensified, I don't know if we can ever get that back in the can so Canadian uh, politics is civilized again. I think that between social media and the extreme reaction of extreme groups, uh, we're going to move more and more in the same direction as the United States. And I think in, in terms of our politics being bitter, nasty, uh, not collective judgments. And I really regret that because I think once it's out of the can, you'll never get it back. Jerry? Well, if that's true, then people like the three of us will probably not be as interested in being part of it. On the other hand, if I may say so, people like us will be more necessary than we've ever been uh, to fight it off. I think it, it's, I want to say that it's a great deal of the of American influence flowing into Canada. Um, almost on a daily basis, my wife Carol and I exchange the latest piece of crazy news from the United States. The, uh, the latest is how many congressmen now are joining a movement to say that the uh, that the uh, riot of January 6th last year was in fact a blow for democracy. Uh, and you try to uh, do something with that and you can't. Um, on the other hand, I don't know how that explains Poland and Hungary and, and no, the Philippines where this, this so-called populist hate uh, seems to spread so easily. 
Uh, I want to tell you, I have no idea what to do about it. I have no understanding of the people who are who are picketing uh, the prime minister every day. Uh, there can't be more than two minutes from my house. There's a pickup truck with a big sign on it that says F Trudeau. Yeah. Who are those people? Why is it there? Nobody knows anything. Just sits there. And they've been everywhere. These people full of hate and bile. They but, are, don't know. No, just, I don't want to be too crazy. simplistic about it. That's my, I guess that's my concern why I raised the David Brooks stuff that like you can sort of say we import it from the U.S., but we've gotten away with that argument for a long time. I mean, I think we're grown-ups. We have to take it on ourselves. And and it's it's not just on the right. It's also on the left. So it's right. like that dysfunction. But, but, Pam, where it comes from is irrelevant. Yeah. Well, absolutely. What is relevant is that, that it is happening here now in Canada. I mean, think of the ridiculousness of picketing hospitals because, right. you're you know, the nurses and the people in, in those have, have gone beyond uh, anything. They don't make policy. Work. <laughs> no, well, not a, they just look how hard they worked and what they've yeah. done for everybody. And to single them out is a, is absolutely insane. Yeah. Okay, Hugh, I'm going to leave the final word for today to you. What does it all mean? What, it what mean? does it all mean, Hugh? What, yeah, <laughs> like, like, I am likely to know more than anybody else. But here's my instinct. My instinct is that, like the pandemic itself, this election has unveiled some structural weaknesses in how we go about running elections, in how we facilitate exchange between the leadership candidates. Um, I don't think the media has had a great run. Uh, there have been a series of things that have happened which require, I mean, when one political party says, we're going to essentially run our campaign from a hotel studio in Ottawa, so we're going to be in town hall meetings right across the country, we're going to radically change the, the whole notion of the political tour because of the pandemic and whatever, that's something which I think should be really thought about and diagnosed and analyzed because it could have an absolutely fundamental impact on how politics goes forward in the future. There's been very little coverage of that. There's been very little coverage of other substantive issues. And I think what happens is when there's not substantial coverage of the deep issues that matter, then somebody throwing a handful of gravel becomes a front page story. Yeah. Not, not that I'm in favor of letting people throw gravel at anything. No, no, but it's, yeah, in terms of the numbers. Yeah. It means where those sorts of things have gone on in many, many ways, in many, many, for history. And so it's been that lack of perspective. So I blame the media a bit, and I blame those, of, uh, those who are now involved in the political process for not stepping back and saying, what really matters here? And we want to get our own majorities. We want to get our own pluralities. But we have to deal with some of those issues, and not a lot of that has happened. Gentlemen, as always, uh, your thoughts are appreciated. They're insightful. And I guess we'll all be watching the election on Unless Monday. There's, not a, there's, there's no up. tennis game. Right. 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 There's, as long as there's no tennis game. Michael Kirby, Jerry Kaplan, Hugh Siegel. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon, I hope. Take care, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. That's it for this edition of No Nonsense. Election coming soon. See you soon.